It is time for us to begin Bible class. If you'll be getting your Bibles out and turning to the prophet of Zechariah. Zechariah is where we're going to be in our study as we begin here in just a few moments. Before we get started, let's go to God in a word of prayer, please. Our wonderful God and Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. We are grateful, Father, for the opportunity we have to come together and to open up our Bibles and study. We pray, Father, as we enter into our period of Bible study that we could put aside all the things of this life that distract our minds from our purpose in being here and that we could focus upon thy word and upon learning some things that will help to encourage us and help to make us better servants of thine and help us to better teach others. We're grateful, Father, for thy word and for its availability and its simplicity and for the encouragement that it gives us. And we pray, Father, that we'd uh, see the need to feed upon it each and every day of our lives, that we'd hunger and thirst after it, that our faith would increase, and that we might have a home in heaven with thee someday. We are thankful, Father, for opportunities like we have here this, morning, this evening to come together and to study thy word together. And we pray, Father, that your name would be honored and glorified in all that we do tonight. We are uh, mindful, Father, that we have uh, many that are battling various ailments as well as family members on the minds of those uh, that are members here, and we pray your rich blessings upon all of them. We pray, Father, to be with those that have recently lost loved ones, that they might find comfort in thee and thy word. We pray, Father, at this time for forgiveness, that we can stand clean and pure as we went into our period of study. We're grateful for thy mercy and for your grace. We recognize, Father, without that we would not have hope. We recognize, Father, that we've all fallen short and sinned, and that's why the death of your son was necessary. We pray, Father, to help strengthen us that we might choose the way of escape in the future from temptation. Give us a humble heart that when we fail to do so that we will repent and turn back to Thee. We pray now, Father, to continue with us through this hour. and We pray, Father, that You continue with us through the remainder of our lives. Help keep us faithful to Thee and may we help each other to live so heaven can be our home. For this is our prayer in Your Son's blessed name. Amen. So said, we're in the prophet of Zechariah. We are down really to the final final two of the minor prophets, Zechariah and then the book of Malachi. So probably uh, three weeks, m maybe four weeks before we're finishing up with the minor, the minor prophets. Uh, the prophet of Zechariah, I, I would venture to say, is probably one of the prophets that we are the least familiar with. And probably the reason that we're the least familiar with it is really a couple of reasons. Number one, it is by far the longest and the most difficult of all of the minor prophets. Uh, we've come out of the prophet of Haggai that was two chapters. Habakkuk was three chapters. And so you can easily sit down in one setting and read those and not just read them but sort of digest the, the information that's contained within them. Zechariah, on the other hand, is a book that not only is it longer, 14 chapters, but it's a lot more difficult because of the style in which it is uh, written. Jesse Little Baxter said in commenting upon this book that after the short forthright message of Haggai, this book of Zechariah may seem discouragingly complicated. In other words, when you, and when you deal with stuff like, like the book of Zechariah, sometimes what happens is... You just sort of avoid it. I like the book of Revelation. You know, I, I know people that have told me they've, they've been members of churches where they study the Bible all the way through from Genesis to Jude, and then they start back because when they get to a difficult book or something that challenges, it's easy just sort of to skip over that and to move on to something more simple. A.C. Leopold said in his commentary on Zechariah, it is not so difficult of interpretation as to totally baffle the student, Though the problems it offers are many, and we cannot presume to speak with authority on all of them, yet the book as a whole can be studied with great profit and to the strengthening of one's faith, and the New Testament makes repeated use of the book, so should we. And we'll talk a little bit about the frequent use that the, Old Te that the New Testament makes of the book of Zechariah, which tells me there's great value in us studying it and being able to use it in the right, in the right way. So let's talk about Zechariah here if we can, for just a few moments. Uh, let's talk about the man, Zechariah, first of all. What do we know about him? What does his name mean? Well, his name means whom uh, Jehovah remembers. And I do think it's significant to his message. God is really telling the people of Israel, uh, the people of Judah, excuse me, through the book of, 
um, of Zechariah that I haven't forgotten about you. I am remembering you, and if you remember me, then I will bless you in these efforts to rebuild the temple and to restore the nation of, uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, it is a common name in the Bible. In fact, uh, there are 29 uh, different Zacharias that are mentioned in the Bible, and so it's a very common biblical name. What do we know about this particular Zechariah? Not really a whole lot. He is the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, and he was a contemporary of Haggai. Um, he is likely younger than Haggai. We base that partly on the fact that when they're mentioned together, his name always appears second. That's not conclusive evidence, but most believe that he's probably a younger prophet. In fact, when you connect him back, to what is said in the book of Nehemiah. The, the book of Nehemiah, you may remember when the people came out of, out of bondage uh, and they returned back. Nehemiah chapter 12, well, I went too far there. Nehemiah chapter 12 ha had mentioned that in the days of Jehoiakim, the priests, the heads of the fathers' houses were, and it mentions all of these names, the one that's sort of important to you and I is the name of Edo, or Edo, which is mentioned there in the lineage of Zechariah. And what that means is if this is the same man, and it likely is, that Zechariah was not only a prophet, but he was also a priest. What it probably also means is if it, he's mentioned in the days of Nehemiah that Zechariah is probably a really young priest and prophet at the time that he begins to deliver this message to uh, the people who have come back out of uh, captivity. And the book of Zechariah covers information that take place somewhere between 520 to about 518 B.C. There are several dates that are given throughout the book of Zephaniah. For example, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, that should be capitalized, I pasted it in there so I don't know why it's not, but that would be about October to November of 520 B.C. We have the 24th day of the 11th month, that's in 519 B.C., and then you have the fourth month of the, uh, the the fourth year of King Darius, and that's in 518 BC, and that's the last date that's given. So we know based upon that that his work was done somewhere in the range of 520 to about 518 uh, BC is the time that that was uh, that that his prophecy would have uh, covered. What, what's going on at the time that Zechariah prophesying? Very quickly. What, 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 what is he up against? The background is the same as Haggai. So we're not going to go through a whole lot. But what did we say it was taking place during the days of Haggai? The people had come out of captivity. And after they came out of captivity, what had happened is they failed to finish the temple. They were concerned about self and their wants. And as a result of that, things weren't going very well. You may remember the crops are failing, the economy's failing, and they're wondering what? Why aren't we being blessed? And, and what had happened is they had laid the foundation of the temple, and for 16 years, what had they done? Nothing. And Haggai and Zechariah were called, according to Ezra 5 and verse 1, to tell the people, okay, listen, it's time to put your own stuff aside and focus on the work of the Lord and get that temple built. Um, the approach that both of these men take is somewhat different from one another, as we'll notice. In fact, the works of Haggai and Zechariah complement one another, Billingsley says, Rick Billingsley. He said, Haggai offered a stern rebuke and admonition as well as encouragement. You may remember Haggai came and said, listen, you say it's not time to build, but you've got time what? For your paneled houses, you've got time for what you want to do. And so he had, he had uh, offered a stern rebuke to them. Zachariah's approach, is, or, uh, uh, Zachariah's approach is a little bit different. Not only is it a different kind of language, but Zachariah deals primarily in encouraging words and visions that would stimulate God's people in finishing the building of the temple. In fact, do, do you have your Bibles open there? Look at what is said in verse... Uh, 13, in terms of what Zechariah is going to offer to the people, the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with what? Good and comforting words. And that's really what Zechariah does. It's not to say there's not anything negative in the epistle, but it's really visions that are designed 
to encourage and to tell the people God is with you and we can finish this work and we can prosper we can prosper in it one of the things you got to remember about the book of Zechariah however is it's what we call apocalyptic literature what does that mean besides hard it's in, it's in, it's figurative it's in signs symbols uh, there, are, there are four different Bible books that are either entirely or largely apocalyptic. What are they? Ezekiel, Daniel 7 through 12. That's why I say first six chapters are not, but Daniel 7 through 12, the prophet of Zechariah, and then the New Testament book of Revelation. And what all those have in common is they're the hardest parts of Scripture. Daniel 7 through 12, uh, the book of Ezekiel, that's difficult stuff. And you have to approach apocalyptic language different than you would narrative, different than you would an historical book. And so when we think about it, we have to realize, you know what, we're dealing with symbolic language. One of the other things that we have to remember when we're dealing with apocalyptic books is we can't afford to be dogmatic at times. And what I mean by that, we can't always come down and say what? This is what it means, 100% sure, anybody else that says, says something different, what? They're, they're just wrong about that. A lot of times with, with apocalyptic language, we just really can't be dogmatic. There are times in the book of Revelation I'll say about this might mean what? This, but I'll leave open the possibility that this other explanation may be, may be right. And so what that means is we can't be overly dogmatic about some of the visions. It also means that we interpret it in light of clear Bible teaching and principles. One thing I always say, for example, when we get to the book of Revelation, is we may disagree over what is meant by the first and the second resurrection of Revelation 20 or some of the, the figures. But what I do know is in light of everything else the Bible says, we can't be talking about a future earthly kingdom. We can't be talking about... Uh, those kind of things, because the Bible very clearly says what? My kingdom's not of this world. It, when the Lord comes, it's going to mark the end. So I've got those clear principles laid out, and I know whatever the figures mean, whatever the visions mean, it has to agree what? With what those other things say. Same thing is true in the book of Zechariah. It is not used as frequently as Revelation, but it ranks pretty close to Revelation in visions that the premillennialist really like to use and to talk about. And so what we need to know how to use them because you will encounter them from time to time in talking to somebody that believes in a future earthly kingdom uh, here on this earth. So what do we have to remember? We may not be dogmatic, but we need to interpret it in light of very clear biblical teaching and principles. Now, what's the message? Really a couple of things I would say in terms of just summing up the message of Zechariah, getting this bird's eye view. Number one, his message, like Haggai, is what? Finish building the temple. Okay, let's, it's time to build God's house. Um, and so that's, that's really the end goal, or maybe we could say that's the purpose for which he writes. There's a difference sometimes in the purpose of a book and the theme of a book. A purpose is what the, the aim is. That's what you're leading to. Uh, let me illustrate that. Book of Hebrews. What's the purpose of Hebrews? Well, it's to encourage the people to remain faithful to God. Okay, that's the purpose. What's the theme is to say Christ is so much better. The discussion of that message is designed for the purpose of keeping them faithful to God. So the purpose of Zechariah is to say what? Build the temple. Get finished with that work. How Zechariah gets there, the message he's portraying is really the message that says that if you will be faithful to me, then we're going to be successful. The success of the people was dependent on their obedience to God. Uh, in other words, if you obey me, if you're with me, what? I'll be with you. And we'll succeed in this task. And so when, when people sum up the message, this is what you hear, something like this. Haley says... The prophet sees and emphasizes the truth that ultimate triumph is dependent on divine cooperation and one uh, and uh, and one the submission of, and, and the submission of the people to God's divine will. In other words, if you're going to succeed, it requires two things. What's that? God's blessings 
but it also requires what? Your obedience in order to get those. Bob Waldron says in his book, he sums up the message of Zechariah. He said it presents the truth of Psalm 34, 15, 16. What is that truth? Anybody know? You're going to know as soon as we quote it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do we, First Peter chapter 3, that's contained as well. In other words, he says what the message of Zechariah is, is if you serve me, what? I'm with you. I'm here, and I will bless you, and you will succeed. And so he just simply says, if I was going to remember the theme of Zechariah, i just remember the words of Psalm 34, 15 and, and 16. Billingsley said there are two major lines of thought running throughout the book, the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. So what happens is the purpose is to motivate these people to be faithful to God in finishing the temple, and how they get there is through these visions, God is saying to the people, I know what's going on, and I am with you as long as you are with me. And we'll finish this work, and not only will we finish this work of building uh, the temple, but there are greater blessings that are in store. And, and then another thing you have to remember about the book of Zechariah is it's heavily messianic. In fact, it rivals in terms of messianic prophecy, uh, I guess word for word, it would, it would rival the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is a much longer book. Um, but when you look at the number of messianic prophecies contained in, in Zechariah, for there to only be 14 chapters, it really does r rival Isaiah in that regard. For example, think about some of these that, that you and I are familiar with. Christ was to build a temple or the church. He was going to sit and rule upon his throne as both priest and king. Remember his entry into Jerusalem on a colt. Where's that found? It's in Zechariah. The, the vision of the smitten shepherd in chapter 9. Uh, him being betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Him being an offering for sin. The piercing of his hands. All of those are contained in, that's an example, of what we find in the book of Zechariah. So not only do you have the message for the people immediately to build the temple, really he's saying as we build the temple, there's a greater temple that's coming. And he's pointing to the greater blessings coming through uh, Christ Jesus. And that's one reason why the book of Zechariah is used so heavily in the New Testament. Uh, it is not the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. What's the most quoted New Test Old Testament book in the New Testament? Psalms. And then probably after that, you've got Isaiah and others that, that occur. Psalms is by far the most quoted of the books. But uh, in the case of Zechariah, because of the messianic element, as, he's, as Leopold will say, there's no other prophet whose book contains such a wealth and variety of this element, not only in proportion to the total amount of material offered, but also the sum total of its passages. So when we're looking at the book of Zechariah, we're looking at messianic prophecy. Now... When we look at Messianic prophecy, one thing that does for you and me is it helps to solidify and strengthen our faith. Because I look back and I think, okay, now Zechariah prophesied, what year did we say? 520 B.C.? Okay, 520 B.C. And, and five, uh, about 550 years later, Jesus comes riding in Jerusalem on a donkey. Well, how in the world did he know that? Or 550 years later, Jesus is betrayed, and it just happens to be what? The exact sum of money that Zechariah talked about. So all of that helps to solidify my faith that these prophets were indeed inspired and that I can trust what the Bible has to say. And so it's just an impressive book because of the number of messianic prophecies that are contained therein. When we talk about Zechariah in the New Testament, there's always a debate when you go to identify the number of quotes of a Bible book in the, Old Test in the, in the New Testament. Um, and you'll get differing totals from different people. P part of that is, it's like one of my Bible programs, you've got citations, you've got echoes, you've got allusions. And so there's disagreement sometimes as to what is a quotation. But it has been estimated by some, and this is a quotation from Roper and his commentary, that there are 71 quotations of the book of Zechariah 
in the New Testament. Most of those, 31, are found in the book of Revelation. Probably not surprising. Why would that not surprise us? They're both what? Apocalyptic. And the, the book of Revelation is the most Old Testament of the New Testament books. It borrows heavily from that, from that genre. But where 31 of these are found in Revelation, 27 appear in the Gospels. And many of these quotations are found in the Gospels relate to the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. And he gives some examples there that we've already appealed to. And so the fact that this book occurs so frequently in the New Testament in terms of being alluded to, to establish the, the, the Messiahship of Jesus or to encourage individuals in the book of Revelation tells me I need to be familiar with this material. I need to be able to understand it because it was important enough that it makes frequent use of it in the New Testament. So when we look at this book, and we're approaching it now, we, we know the background and what Zechariah is trying to accomplish. There are really four points to the book of, Revel uh, book of Zechariah. Number one, there's the introduction. This is a call to repentance in, in chapter 1, verses 1 through verse 6. It just sort of lays the groundwork for what's going to come. You've got a series of eight visions in chapter 1 and in verse 7 through chapter 6 and verse 15. Each one of those visions, by the way, sort of follows the same pattern. The vision is described. Then Zechariah says, what does that mean? And it didn't word it exactly that way, but in essence, that's what he says is, what does that mean? What is that it's supposed to be? And then there is the explanation of the vision that helps us to understand what was, what was meant by it. So you have eight of those that occur in chapter 1, in verse 7 through chapter 6 and verse 15. You sort of had a, a, an interlude in 7 and 8 where there's a question about fasting. In other words, the, the people had sort of been in mourning for 70 years. Jerusalem had been destroyed. They'd been in captivity. They had been in mourning. But now they're back home. Should we, should we continue to fast? Is that something we should do? So you've got a question. The answer, by the way, is don't worry about your fasting. Worry about living righteous lives in essence, is what he's going to tell them. And then he's going to promise future blessings in chapter 8. And then you have two burdens in chapter 7 and verse 19, uh, Zechariah 9 to Zechariah 14. I think the first covers 9, 10, and 11. And then the last burden or oracle is going to cover uh, 12 through 14. And 9 through 14, that is heavily messianic. Now, we're going to see some other messianic prophecies prior to that. But those last burdens particularly fo uh, focus on the future and, and the Messiah. So if you want to remember your, your basic outline of Zechariah, that's your basic outline. If you want to narrow it down for ease to two parts, you've got visions, chapter 1 through chapter 6. You've got really the, uh, the burdens are going to appear in chapter 7 through chapter 14, but I prefer the four-point outline because of the other couple of, of sections there. So let's get our Bibles open there if you don't have them already. Let's start in verse 1, and then we're going to try to talk about these visions as best we can here in the first six chapters, five or six chapters tonight. In 520 B.C., the message came to Zechariah in verses 1 through verse 6, and the message came that God has been very angry with your fathers. In fact, God's anger is seen three times in chapter 1. God had been angry with the fathers. What had God done in his anger to the fathers? What had happened to them 70 years prior to this? They had been destroyed and they had gone into captivity. All of that in spite of the fact that God had sent the former prophets and what did he say to the people? Repent. And really that's what Zechariah is coming to the people and saying, my message to you is the same as the message of the fathers to, the, to, the, um, to your fathers, which is return to me, come back. I want you to notice a statement in verse 3 here. The Lord of hosts says, I now return to you, saith the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers whom the uh, former prophets preached. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. And so it begins in verse 3, this statement, the Lord of hosts, that describes the power of God. The host is the army. God has all the armies of the angels, all the hosts at his disposal. To describe God as the Lord of hosts is to describe him as one with with great power, one that has the ability to bless, one that has the ability to judge and, and to punish. It is a statement that in 14 chapters of Zechariah will appear 52 times. 
So if you go through the book of Zechariah and you're highlighting there the Lord of hosts, it's going to occur 52 times in these 14 chapters. There's, that's an emphasis that Zechariah is, is making. It's the Lord of hosts that is delivering this message. And what he says is your fathers didn't listen. They didn't hear and they didn't heed. And look at verse 5. Your fathers, where are they now? What happened to them? They were gone. And the prophets, do they live forever? No, but their message lives on. And I think that's the point. So my words and my statutes which I commanded my servant the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do for us, according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. I think this is what he's saying. Some say there's a contradiction here. The fathers didn't return and then the fathers did return. I think this is what he's saying. Before the captivity, when God had sent the people like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and others to preach to the people and say, you need to repent, they didn't what? They didn't listen. God sent them into captivity. What had captivity done for the people? It had caused some of them to listen and to come back to the Lord. It had sort of purified the people. In fact, it's interesting, just by way of example, that in none of the post-exilic books... Daniel, um, uh, the latter part of Daniel, uh, Zechariah, Haggai, Habakkuk, and Malachi, you know what you don't hear anything about in those books? I idolatry or anything like that. You don't hear about idolatry. Now, there were some other problems, but, but my, my point is simply this, that captivity had had an effect of what? Of bringing some of them back to uh, the Lord. And so he calls on them and says in verses 1 to verse 6, listen to my message and repent and turn back to me. At that point, he then begins to relate all of these visions. What's the first vision that he sees in chapter 1? The vision of the horses and the riders. There's a man riding on a horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, and behind them were horses red, sorrel, and white. And so in this vision, you see these horse, uh, horses. Either the first horse had a rider, doesn't say anything about a rider on the other horses, but uh, they're, they're of different colors. Who is the rider, by the way, on the horse that stood among the myrtle trees? Verse 11. It's the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees. So it's the angel of the Lord that is identified uh, there. Well, Zachariah says, same thing you and I are saying, which is in verse 9 what? What does that mean? What, what, what is that? Um, and the answer comes back that the, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent forth to and fro throughout the earth or to patrol the earth. Think about somebody being on patrol. What are they doing? Watching, guarding, observing, looking, protecting. So these are the ones that patrol the earth and walk to and fro throughout the earth. In verse 11, it says, Behold, all the earth is resting and quiet. And the point of that vision really just seems to be emphasizing God knows what? He knows everything. He knows what's going on. He's very aware of that. He is omniscient. Don't press the vision beyond that. What does sorrel mean? Why is one of them red? One of them white? I don't know. God doesn't tell us that. I'm not even sure it's significant. What he's just simply saying in a figurative way is God knows everything. He is omniscient. And right now, everything is restful and quiet. Does that necessarily mean everything is well? No. In fact, uh, as the vision uh, goes on, some people needed to be punished. Uh, one commentator pointed this out. He said, it's sort of like your kids sometimes. You ever been in the house when your kids were little and it got quiet, and when it got quiet, what happened? You got worried. You know, Somebody go see what's going on. You know, they've got to be... And sometimes when things are quiet, that's not necessarily uh, good. It may be that, uh, uh, that wickedness has been accepted, that there's peace where there shouldn't be peace. But right now, it's peaceful and quiet. And then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you are angry these 70 years, probably referring to the 70 years that, Dan, that Jeremiah talked about in Jeremiah 25, 11 to 12. In other words, okay, everything's quiet, but what about what? What about us? When are you going to have mercy on us? 
they looked right there from their perspective right now, what was Jerusalem still like? You didn't have a temple. You didn't have a wall. They were still under the foot of a foreign uh, power in the Medes and the Persians. So when are you going to start blessing us? And the Lord answered the angel who talked with me with good and comforting words. And there's words he spoke where I am zealous for Jerusalem, or I'm extremely jealous, and for Zion with great zeal. And I am angry with the nations at ease. Th those nations that are round about had punished and still even now are controlling uh, the people of God. He said, I'm angry with them. I was angry with them a little, and they helped, but what? With evil intent. The NIV says, but they went too far in their punishment. Uh, and the idea seems to be, did God use these nations to punish Judah? Yeah, absolutely. Babylon, Assyria. Did they do it because they wanted to help God out? No, they did it because they wanted to increase their own power. It was with evil intent. Or if the NIV is correct, I went too far, they went too far. And so what the Lord said is, I'm angry with them, and I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. Uh, does the ESV record, record that in the present tense? I have returned. There's one section where they use the present tense as opposed to the... But, but either way, the point is God was even working for them at that point in time. God said, I am coming with mercy. And my house shall be built. That's the temple. A surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem, meaning it's going to be growing and increasing. My city shall again spread out through prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. So that first vision, God just simply says in that first vision, I know what's going on, and I am going to act for Jerusalem's good and for their benefit. I'm very zealous for them. Then in verse 18, there is the second vision of the four horns and the four craftsmen uh, that are mentioned here, our carpenters. And he raised his eyes, and there were four horns. What does a horn almost always represent in apocalyptic language? Power, strength. And so this is power here. And the angel who talked with me, what are these? And I said, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. What do those horns represent? Those nations that had worked against God's people and scattering them, particularly Assyria and Babylon, but probably all the enemy nations. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? And so he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head, but the craftsmen are coming to terrify them to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. What are the craftsmen coming to do? Destroy the horns. So what does that vision mean? The people that were the enemies of God's people, God was going to what? He was going to punish them. He was going to punish them. They were going to be destroyed. So... The first couple of or the visions here in chapter 1 are just really encouraging the people, saying, I know what's going on, I'm going to act for you, and any of these obstacles that are in your way are going to be removed. Then in chapter 2, you've got the man with a, a measuring line. And he goes out to measure Jerusalem, and when he measures it, what does he find? It's going to, or how does he describe it in verse 4? It's going to be inhabited as a town without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I say that the Lord will be a wall of fire all around and I will be the glory in her midst. In other words, when it describes it as a city without walls, what does that indicate? There's figurative language involved there. Not protected. Yeah, he obviously looked at the future. It's going to be what? The Lord's going to protect it. Remember, it's still going to be several years before the wall is rebuilt. And I think immediately for the people of this day, he said, I'm going to be with you, and you don't have to worry about protection because who's going to take care of them? God is. I'll be the wall of protection around, uh, around you, and I will be the glory in your uh, midst. And so he calls on those that are in Babylon to come uh, and escape you who dwell with the daughters of Babylon and for thus saith the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who uh, touches the, you touches the apple of my eye. And that's a statement that God had made in Deuteronomy 32.10 
which is to say they're the apple of his eye. He was going to take care of them and he was going to provide for them. But this vision, I believe, in fact, I'm confident on this vision, looks beyond just the immediate. I think it had part to do with that immediate God's going to take care of, God is going to provide for you, God is going to bless you, you're going to get finished building this temple. But it looks beyond that because in verse 10 in this vision, he said, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, saith the Lord. That's quoted several times in the book of Revelation. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people. Well, what point in time did many nations come to the Lord and become his people? It's a messianic prophecy. In fact, when you go home, if you know how to do this, get down at your computer, or you can use your iPhone or Android phone, whatever you want to use, and just call up the book of Zechariah and look up this phrase, in that day, and see how many times it occurs. And what you'll find, particularly at the very end of it, is every time that phrase is used in the book of Zechariah, Harkrider has the chart in his Bible, I mean his workbook, it's a pointing to the coming of the Messiah. In that day, you know, he's going to come riding on a dog. In that day, this is what's going to happen. So when he talks about in this passage, and I would highlight it, many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people. That reminds me of Isaiah chapter 2 when he talks about this kingdom, and people from all around are going to come to Zion and to be part of this. And so ultimately, what is the, what is the, the city without walls that encompasses people from all around? It's the Lord's church. And that's why I say sometimes you have in these prophecies, and Zechariah I think is probably more this way than a lot of prophets, what we call dual prophecies. And that is, it was designed to encourage them right then to say, I'm with you and I'm going to protect you and I'm going to take care of you, but also to say beyond that there's another day coming that's even better and brighter than that. And so this vision of the measuring line speaks of the inhabiting of Jerusalem, but ultimately to the Jerusalem that is going to encompass people of all nations. Chapter 3 is the vision of the high priest. Who was the high priest at this point in time? Joshua. And in this vision, Satan is standing at his right hand to oppose him or to accuse him. Uh, most translations say Satan. It could be, the word Satan could be translated as accuser but, uh, and, and refer to human accuser, but most translations believe Satan is the one uh, referenced here. And he's accusing the high priest. And the Lord says to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen re Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? What is a brand plucked from the fire? Think about it this way. Some translations would read this way. Think about like a fire, if you will, and you've got a limb that's in that fire, and it's, it's just burning, and before it burns up, you take that out of the fire so that it's preserved. And so it looked like Jerusalem. It looked like the people of God. It looked like the priesthood. What was going to happen to it? It was going to be completely destroyed. Why wasn't it completely destroyed? God said, I could have made you like Sodom and Gomorrah, Amos chapter 4, meaning what could God have done? He could have completely wiped them out, but he, he, he rescued them as it is like a brand plucked out of the fire that was burning, about to burn up, and he rescued them. And so in this, in this vision, I think, and I'll say I think, that Joshua, is not, he's not talking about Joshua himself. I think Joshua represents the priest, by extension the priests really were representative of the people as a whole. And when he looked at Joshua in, in chapter, in verse 3, how was he dressed? Filthy garments. What do you think that probably represents? The sins of the people. Um, in fact, some commentators believe that as the people had come back out of captivity, remember, who was partly to blame for the captivity of the people? The priest. They had not been the kind of spiritual leaders they needed to be. And, and, and that now they've come back out and now that the foundation of the temple has been laid and people were saying with regard to the priest, we're done with you. Uh, you don't have any part of this. It's your fault all this happened to begin with. And so 
what happens in verse 4 is the Lord says, Take away the filthy garments from him. See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. What does that represent? God's forgiveness. Those filthy garments have been removed, and it's been replaced with clean garments. And so really what God is saying to the people, is God with the priest in this effort to rebuild the temple? Is he with them? Is he going to bless them? Yes. God had all the sins past they put those off God has forgiven those and he gives them a clean turban on his head and they put clean clothes on him so it's as if all that has been taken away God's with them but then in verse 6 God says if you walk in my ways talking to Joshua if you keep my commandments then you also judge my house and likewise have charge in my courts and I will give you a place to walk and among these Uh, among those who stand here. And here, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before me, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. So what he does is he moves from saying to Joshua and them, I'm what? I'm with you to say I'm bringing somebody what? More important. Somebody greater. Who is that? My servant, the branch. It's Jesus. You know, there, there's little doubt. It's one of those that I'm, I'm pretty confident. I know some commentators say, well, it's Zerubbabel, it's, it's Joshua. When you look at that phrase throughout the, the Old Testament, Isaiah 11, the book of Jeremiah, the branch is always a reference to Jesus Christ. And you can mark these passages down. Here, Isaiah 4, 2, Isaiah 11, 1 to 10, Jeremiah 23, 3, Jeremiah 33, 15, Zechariah 6, 12 to 13. In fact, go over there just uh, probably just one page turn in your Bible. When he talks about the branch in chapter 6, he's the one that's going to build the temple of the Lord and who is going to be king and priest on the throne. Who could that possibly be? It has to be Jesus. Couldn't be anybody but Jesus. So he's pointing beyond that day to the coming of the branch and behold the stone that I've laid before Joshua. That stone could be the Messiah himself, Jesus is the chief cornerstone, or it could be a reference to the kingdom that was going to come. I think it's more likely. Remember in Daniel chapter 2, when he pictured the kingdom, there was a a stone or rock that was cut out that grew into the great mountain. Uh, Same thing over in Zechariah chapter 6. You see that again. And so upon the stone are seven eyes, seven being perfection, God's watchful care in bringing this about. And look at verse 10. Underline it. What does it say? And that day, day saith the Lord, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. When this branch comes in the kingdom that he brings in, everybody that's part of this kingdom are going to invite their neighbors to what? Come and enjoy the prosperity under our... It's not talking about a literal fig tree. It's not talking about literal uh, vines. He's saying the spirits... You come and you can what? Enjoy all the wonderful blessings that we are enjoying. And so the vision of the trial and the acquittal of the high priest is vision number four. Vision number five is the golden candlestick and the two olive uh, trees. Let me hit this one real real, real quickly for you uh, for the sake of time. You've got the, 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 the olive trees and the lampstands. And in verse five, the, the question is raised, do you know what these are? And he, I said, no, my Lord. And he said... This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord God of hosts. Where you are, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and you shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. This is what he's saying concerning Zerubbabel, who's the leader trying to bring about the building of this temple. All these obstacles in your way, what's God going to do? They're going to be taken out of the way. And you're going to build the temple not by human strength, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And you're going to put the capstone on it. Um, I, I don't know how we would word that today, but the capstone would have been the final stone placed on the top of the temple. So when that was placed, it would mean it, the work was done. Okay. Done. So that vision is really designed to say, guess what? The temple is going to be finished, and we're going to... The, the, the final touches on it. The capstone is going to be placed on it. And for those that have despi- despised the day of small things, for these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand is rolled. By the way, I think the two 
uh, anointed ones are Zerubbabel and Joshua in verse 14, the priest and the spiritual leader that helped to bring that about. But you know what the day of small things were? Very quickly, because we'll pick up in chapter 5 next week. What did the people do when the temple was, foundation was laid? They cried. It ain't very big. It didn't look very good. It was a day of small... They despised it. And yet, what is said through Zechariah is... Don't, for who has despised the day of small things, for these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand is rubble. They'll rejoice to see that, that temple completed and to see it finished. So you, you can see sort of the different approach of Zechariah. And why, to some degree, him and Haggai make a perfect complement to one another. Haggai said, don't be selfish. Get busy. Zechariah's coming and saying, if you'll just do it, God will be with you and let you finish that, that work. If you would be turning to your son, your song books to number 263 and what the invitation song here shortly. In preparing the invitation tonight, I, I've thought a lot today about our world and our country and how different it is from when I was a kid um, and trying to remember how used to people didn't look so much to their own self-interest. And there was a lot of compromise and a lot of working together. Uh, Take, for example, our government today. Our government is, is so one-sided to each party uh, that we can't hardly agree on anything. We can't hardly pass any laws uh, because of it. And it's not the fault of one, it's the fault of, of both. You've got some that are so far left, uh, they can't reason and try to meet in the middle, and you've got some that are so far right, the same way. And a big part of it is they're looking out for their own self-interest. It's what about, what can I get from me? And instead of trying to compromise and, and give and take for both sides. So I was looking at some passages of scripture, and the first one I was looking at was Philippians chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And that's something right there that we've lost. We've lost that ability to look for the interest of others and be willing to give, to have that servant's heart and, and want to... Uh, work with people. There's just so much one-sided of being selfish. It's all about me and getting what I want. I don't care what you get. I just want to get what I want. And that's our world today. I was watching, and this is a little bit of a far-out example, but I'm going to use it because it, it did make a good point. So I was, I was scrolling through videos, and I saw this video of this AI-generated film. And it was about 10 minutes long. Uh, I watched it before I came here tonight. And basically, it was an artificial intelligence film ba about uh, visitors from another world. And it was about 10 minutes long, and it showed these visitors showing up to our planet, and it showed our country wanting to be the first ones to, to meet them uh, for national security reasons. It showed... The president of Russia also wanting to meet them and get there first. 
And instead of working together to do that, they were fighting and they were telling each other, no, don't do this or we're going to attack you or no, we're going both sides did this. And so they both end up going out uh, to the space station in space and they're both still determined to beat the other one. And when it's all said and done, one of those countries actually attacks the other country to keep them from meeting these visitors first. And after that happens, the visitors start communicating and they say, we came here based on your satellite that you sent. And it showed a picture of one of the Voyager satellites that we sent out into deep space back in the 70s. And they said, you talked of a message of hope and love and working together. And we see now that none of that is true. You don't work together at all. You fight against each other. And because of that, we're not willing to share with you our knowledge, uh, our technology, our expertise. In fact, we consider you a warring world and we're going to eradicate you. And that's what they did. But that goes to show that we can't even, our countries couldn't even work together on something like that. And you think that might be a little outlandish, but look at the things they're trying to do in our country now. Look at how in our very own country, our, our own Congress, the House and the Senate, cannot agree on virtually anything. They want to hold our country hostage, just like they did with the debt ceiling here a couple weeks ago. Anything they can do to try to get what I want versus what we all want and need. They don't want to compromise. Um, another passage of scripture I saw on here um, was Hebrews 12 and 14, and I thought this one was really good too. Hebrews 12 and 14. If I can get to it. It says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So we're told here that we are to strive for peace with who? Everyone. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So we're supposed to work together and stri strive to be peaceful with everyone. Now that doesn't mean we always agree. I mean we're going to have disagreements. But we can still strive for peace and we can still work together in many ways rather than just immediately saying, nope, not going to work with you. Not going to do anything that you want to do. Here's what I want to do. That's where we've got to get back to, you know. And that's not a, that's not an individual thing. That's not a city thing. That's a world problem that we have. That is a world problem. And you can see it today. Like I said, in our own country, you can see it in the other countries, the wars that are going on. It's all about what can I get for me. And we've got to overcome that. And we don't, from a spiritual standpoint, we, we want to make sure that we, we don't do that here. We don't do that in the Lord's church. You know, it doesn't need to be about us. Because we all want things and we all want to do things. And there may be things that we, we want to help with and do. But we need to make sure that we're covering everybody. Of course, from a spiritual standpoint and making sure it's biblical. But... You know, it may be that someone thinks we need to spend uh, for an addition to the building, while others may see that we need to give more out of the treasury to those that are teaching the, wor the word across the world. We can't do it all, but we have to compromise, and we have to look at those things. And, and so it's very, important, uh, it's very important that we don't lose that in the Lord's church, and we don't become like the world has and look at what is in it for me. But if there's anyone here tonight who is not a Christian, uh, if you have heard the word, if you believe in the word, if you confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, if you repent of your sins and are willing to and willing to be baptized in Christ, you can become a Christian tonight. And there's no better time. There's no reason to put it off because we're not guaranteed another day after today. We're not guaranteed another minute. So it's important to do that while you can. 
If there's anyone who has fallen away and needs the prayers of the congregation and wants to get back with God, then now is the perfect time. So why don't you come forward as together we stand and sing. Have thine affection been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Dost thou think things for Jesus but lost? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Hast thou dominion? or self and or sin is thy heart right with God over all evil without and within is thy heart right with God is thy heart right with God washed in the crimson flow announcements before we're dismissed in song and prayer. We want to welcome our visitors, certainly encouraged by your presence, and remind you to be back here on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Bible class and 10 a.m. for worship. Let's remember those that are on our sick list. A few updates. Uh, it's good to see Sister Janie here. She had eye surgery, and I guess that went well, so we're glad that those prayers were answered and she's doing better. Uh, let's remember Susan French and the and the uh, French family, as uh, apparently her dad is in, is in hospice and, and not expected to, to be, uh, not to be with us much longer. So let's, re let's re pray for that family during this difficult time. And let's most importantly remember each other, those that may be struggling spiritually. We pray that we know each other well enough, that we know when things are, are going wrong and we can be there for them. As far as other announcements, uh, we want to remember our, uh, uh, our Bible class that's coming up, our VBS class, I should say, Vacation Bible School. That, that's going to be on the Miracles of Jesus. It's coming quick, July 17th through the 19th at 7, a, uh, 7 p.m. Monday through Wednesday. I invite friends and the community to come to that. It should be very encouraging. And let's just remember. Uh, that's about all I have on the list, I guess. So let's be standing as we have our closing song with number 275 and a closing prayer by Brother Michael Milgram. Am I a soldier of the cross? Number 275. <clears throat> Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause, or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease? While others fought to win the prize and 
sail through bloody seas. Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this dark world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Bow with me, please. Lord, we come before you thanking you for this privilege we have to come together and worship you. We ask this time that you might be with Lowell and Susan and Colton. We ask that you be with the other ones that were mentioned, the sick of our number. We ask that you be the ones that needs encouragement from this world. We ask that we might do something that will encourage somebody to become a child of yours. We ask that we do all things in your name. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. 